In the last video, we looked at ring opening reactions of epoxides under acidic conditions. Now we're going to look at epoxide ring openings when the epoxide is in the presence of a base. So rather than acid catalyzed situations, we're going to focus on base catalyzed situations. So let's take a look at what the differences are between base catalyzed reactions where the epoxide ring is open and acid catalyzed reactions. So base catalyzed ring opening of epoxides is our focus here. So in looking at the base catalyzed ring opening of epoxides, what will be the general reaction is that we'll start with our epoxide, and I'm just doing a generic epoxide right here. It is going to react under basic conditions with a base. That base is typically an anionic base. There are a few exceptions, such as the reaction with ammonia, because ammonia is a base um, that are not anionic. But in most cases, we're looking at anionic bases here, such as, as just a few examples here. That would be things like metal alkoxides. So I'll put that in as M-O-R for metal alkoxides as very common anionic nucleophiles that we could be looking at. Additionally, things like metal hydroxides, such as sodium hydroxide, would be an example possibility as well. Now, in addition to there being an anionic base typically present, there also needs to be a solvent, and that solvent needs to be able to act as a proton donor. So the solvent needs to be able to act as a weak acid, for example, because it's going to be necessary for it to act as a proton donor. So generally what is the case is that the metal alkoxide structure, the alkoxide that is used there, is matched up with a solvent that has the same OR group. So for example, when we talk about a metal alkoxide plus its solvent, the solvent would generally be an alcohol and the specific alcohol that would be used there as a solvent for the metal alkoxide would match the R group of the alkoxide. So for example, if we had sodium methoxide NaOCH3, the solvent that would be used there would be methanol CH3OH, where the OR group, the O alkyl groups, are in agreement between the two of those. Likewise, if we used sodium hydroxide, it would be sodium hydroxide and the solvent there to match those up would be water because both have the OH group. We will talk in the mechanism about why we match up that information. What will happen in the case of the base catalyzed ring opening reactions of epoxides is that the anionic base is going to come in and attack using its lone pair electrons at the less sterically hindered of these two in an SN2 type reaction. And so Overall, what we need to keep in mind here is that there's going to be an SN2 reaction that is an attack of the nucleophile on the less sterically hindered carbon. And that's generally going to be less substituted of the two carbon atoms of the epoxide. In that SN2 attack on the less sterically hindered carbon, there will be inversion of configuration because it is an SN2 reaction. That's one of the hallmarks of SN2, and this is a very traditional SN2 type reaction. Since it's an SN2, there is inversion of configuration because the nucleophile has to attack from the side opposite where the carbon-oxygen bond is breaking. So let's take a look using these criteria that we've talked about here into the mechanism of a specific example reaction. So we'll go ahead and do that. So I've laid out our example problem. Now we'll walk through the mechanism of this base catalyzed ring opening. We recognize the conditions here as basic because of the fact that we would anticipate this oxygen to be an anion. And certainly when you have an oxygen anion, that is going to be basic conditions because oxygen is not particularly stable as an anion. It's eager to react to grab a proton or in the case of our reaction, 
it's going to be acting as a nucleophile because it's going to be forming a bond to a carbon. So what's going to happen here in the first step of the reaction, there's no acid available to protonate. So don't think about protonation as the first step. This is the base catalyzed conditions, not the acidic conditions that we were talking about in the earlier video. So the first step that's going to happen here is that the nucleophile, specifically the anionic nucleophile, is going to attack the less sterically hindered carbon of the epoxide. It's going after the lowest hanging fruit, in other words. It is eager to attack an electrophilic carbon atom, and it doesn't care which one of the two of the carbons that are bonded to the epoxide. It just wants to get to the most easily accessible one, and that's going to be the one that's less sterically hindered, meaning that primary carbons are going to be more subject to attack than secondary secondary are going to be more subject to attack than tertiary. So we can show that happening here by having the methoxide anion, OCH3 minus, come in. We don't really need to show the sodium cation here because it's just a spectator. It's not actually participating or doing anything. And so that basic anion comes in, it comes over, and thinking about which of these two carbons it's going to attack here, versus here, the preferred site is going to be the carbon on the left because that's the less alkyl substituted carbon. That's the less sterically hindered one. So always these nucleophiles that are basic are going to attack at the less sterically hindered carbon of the epoxide. So we attack there at the carbon on the left. That forces the carbon oxygen bond to break and the electrons to go onto the oxygen. So let's go ahead and draw out what results from this. And thinking about the configuration of our product here, keep in mind there is an inversion of configuration. So we need to invert the configuration. And what that means, one way of doing this is to convert that wedge into a dash because as the nucleophile attacks at the less sterically hindered carbon in this SN2 type reaction mechanism, what happens is that the leaving group here is breaking away from the face opposite where the nucleophile is coming in. And so that results in the stereochemistry being flipped from R to S or S to R. And one way to show that that has happened is to convert this wedge into a dash. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go ahead and show oxygen anion is what we will have generated up top here because when we broke that carbon oxygen bond, we left it tethered to this carbon right here as a carbon oxygen bond with an anion there. This carbon that it's bonded to will be bonded to a methyl group and an ethyl group. Nothing has happened at this carbon of the epoxide group that I'm circling right now in terms of manipulating its stereochemistry. So we're going to draw the methyl group still as a dash and the ethyl group still as a wedge at this particular position. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that in. Methyl group as a dash ethyl group as a wedge here. Boom, like so. Then we'll draw our bond over to the other carbon. The other carbon that is the other carbon that was part of the epoxide. So we're drawing this bond right here with this guy over here. And now at this position, the carbon that was part of the epoxide on the left, we need to invert the configuration. And to do that, I'm going to convert the wedge that went to the methyl group into a dash to the methyl group. So to wedge, it became a dash like so. And then the other group that we need to show in there is that we need to show that the methoxy group has come in and formed a bond. So I will go ahead and do that for emphasis in blue here. We would have our O methyl group, OCH3, or you could put OME would be another way of representing an O methyl group on that position. And we've illustrated that the configuration has inverted because at the beginning, the methyl group was a wedge now it's converted into a dash, and so we have inverted the stereochemistry here. Now we're almost done, but not quite done, because what we still have to think about and deal with is that we have an anionic oxygen here, and to make a stable final product, we need to do something with that to make it no longer an anion. And so what that will do is that's a relatively basic 
oxygen atom. And so it is going to be eager to grab a proton from some proton donor source. So we need a source of proton available within this reaction. Definitely not a strong acid, but something that's a weak acid that's capable of donating a proton to our oxygen anion. Looking back at what we have, we used methanol in this reaction mixture and methanol will fill the bill there. It can donate this proton to the oxygen anion there. So our second and final step of this mechanism is that we need to protonate the oxygen anion. So to protonate the oxygen anion, I'm gonna go ahead and redraw the intermediate that I created as a result of the first step of the mechanism there. Keeping my stereochemistry the same as I had already drawn it. And then we bring in our methanol, which I'm going to write as HOCH3 so that that proton is nice and closely aligned here so that we can use our lone pair electrons from the oxygen anion base to pick up a proton from methanol acting as the acid, forcing the oxygen-hydrogen bond to break and the electrons going on to the oxygen to give methoxy anion. Boom, like so. And then we will draw out our organic product here. We have our methoxy group, vicinal to the hydroxy group, and we've got a wedge going to an ethyl group and a dash going to a methyl group to give us our final product of this reaction. So we'll go ahead and circle that stereoselective product of this reaction, illustrating that we've inverted the configuration at the stereocenter that reacted. So the stereocenter that we've inverted the configuration of is just the one right here that I'm highlighting in green in the product. We left the configuration unchanged at the other chiral center, the one that I'm highlighting in red, because nothing happened at that position. As we walk through the mechanism at each step at that particular carbon, going all the way back, circling it at each spot, nothing ever happened to that particular carbon. There's no reaction that broke any of the bonds that were directly to that carbon, so we can invert the configuration at that carbon. But we do at the other carbon, the one that is highlighted as the methyl branch in green here in our final product. And so this brings us to the question of, earlier I mentioned that when you're setting these up, you need to do it so that you have a base where the base has an O alkyl group or whatever your basic group is there, your O R group or your N R group or whatever, so that it matches up with the OR group or whatever group you have present in your solvent. The reason that those need to match as I'm highlighting my laser pointer in the reactants is that in the last step of this, when you need a proton donor and you remove a proton from the solvent, you end up creating something that acts as an anionic nucleophile. And so if what you've created here on the product side is your anionic nucleophile, doesn't match what was originally in the reaction mixture, then you'll end up with a competition between whatever anionic nucleophile you've created here as a product and the one that was present as a reactant originally because both of those will end up being present in the reaction mixture at some point and both will be competing to attack the epoxide electrophilic carbon. So by setting up your reaction so that the structure of the base corresponds to that of the solvent, you'll be able to avoid that problem because any deprotonated solvent that ends up being created will react in exactly the same manner and give exactly the same product as would the base that you started with. In this example problem, what we are going to do is try to provide the reaction mechanism and the major organic product or products for this reaction. Since we've gone through an example already, I recommend you hit pause, try this on your own, and then use the video to go through the solution to it. So let's go ahead and get started with walking through the solution to this particular problem. What we will do in the case of a situation where we recognize that we are working under basic conditions, what will happen is that in the very first step of the mechanism, the nucleophile is going to attack 
the epoxide carbon. Now in the case of this molecule, due to the symmetry that's present here and the fact that each of these two carbons of the epoxide are equally alkyl substituted, it doesn't matter which of those two you stage the attack on. So I'm just going to take my anionic base, specifically the hydroxide anion. The sodium cation is just a spectator, so we don't have to draw it out when we're writing the mechanism. Base comes in, attacks the electrophilic carbon. That forces the oxygen carbon bond to break and the electrons to go onto the oxygen like so. From there, we have a five carbon ring. And up here, we'll have our oxygen anion because what we did was we broke that oxygen carbon bond. The electrons in that bond went onto the oxygen. So oxygen now has three sets of lone pair electrons and is tethered just to this carbon up here. So that's what we're showing here. And we do need to plug our negative formal charge in. And then the other position is going to have a hydroxy group directly bonded there like so because we brought in, in blue, our hydroxy anion. It came in and formed a bond via an SN2 type reaction, whereas the nucleophile is coming in, the leaving group is breaking away to give this carbon oxygen bond here. And remember that just like we saw before, due to the fact that this is an SN2 type reaction that we're observing when we're under basic conditions, we do see the inversion of configuration going on. And so that's why we start off with the bonds leading to the oxygen being cis to one another, and we finish with the product of this step having the two bonds trans to one another because the hydroxide anion is attacking from the back side of the molecule coming in as a dash as the leaving group, that bond between oxygen and carbon breaks, and the leaving group is breaking away as a wedge. Then finally, as the second step of this reaction, we need to do something with this oxygen anion that something is that we'll go in and bring in water for the oxygen anion to become protonated. So oxygen is protonated. And we protonate the oxygen by bringing in our source of proton, that would be our water. Have the basic oxygen come in, attack the proton from the water that forces the hydrogen oxygen bond to break. And that's going to give us our product here with the hydroxy group and a hydroxy group here and those are trans to one another so we can go ahead and circle that as our major organic product here this step of the reaction mechanism would also create hydroxide anion and as we were talking about in our last example it's important that the structure of the solvent that's being used as a proton donor correspond to the structure of the basic group from our base so that in the second step when you deprotonate the solvent what results from that is a base that is the same in structure as the intended reactant so that you don't get any side reactions going on where whatever base you've created as a product is coming in and competing with the desired base to attack the electrophilic carbon of the epoxide. So now that we've reached the end of this video, what you should be able to do is be given a variety of situations where you have an epoxide present with a basic nucleophile, and you should be able to predict what products are created from those reactions, including recognizing that the reactions are stereoselective, so predicting the inverted configuration of the final product, and also recognizing the regioselectivity of the reaction, that if you are working with asymmetrically substituted epoxides, that the basic reaction prefers for the basic nucleophile to attack at the less directly hindered carbon, as is typical for an SN2 type mechanism.